to BJJ Mental Models. I'm your host, Matt Kwan. Steve Kwan is out of the office today. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to an intelligent BJJ approach. This is episode 95. And today we have a very special guest, Mr. Sebastian Lavoie, Sergeant Major. Welcome to the podcast, Seb. Thanks, Matt. So if you have missed the previous episode with Seb, I believe it was episode 77, Ethics of Law Enforcement. It was a very popular episode. We're very excited to have Seb back today. Again, just a little background on Sebastian. He is a sergeant major. Uh, He is also my CrossFit coach. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu brown belt and an all-around great guy, unless you're a bad guy. Then he's a very mean man. And uh, today we wanted to talk about conflict mindset. And this is something that uh, Seb is clearly an expert in. Um, We're just at my school recording this episode right now, and I'm very excited about this. So let's kick it off. Seb, how you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? Very good. Just did some training this morning, getting ready for my match. And I'm ready to talk about conflict mindset through the eyes of a, an actual warrior, not just a butt scooter, but someone who's put his life on the line many times. I'm really excited for this chat. So uh, yeah, let's discuss conflict mindset. Yeah, man. And uh, by the way, I watched your uh, no gi session. You, you guys didn't make a really good case for no gi. <laughs> <laughs> Seb saying that because as he came in, we actually, when we were training, I I hit a drop sale on one of my students and he harsh just smacked his head pretty hard on the on the mat and then the next roll I slipped and I need a guy in the face and then he slipped and need me in the face and it was kind of a, a domino effect of of people getting hurt but we're all good uh we all shook it off and uh yeah it was, it was fun training you know we train pretty hard in the comp class so what yeah. doesn't kill you make you stronger right yeah and you're an expert in that so <laughs> Conflict mindset. I mean, uh, and I think one thing that we really want to talk about this time is looping your experiences back to jujitsu and how that can relate to competition, um, you know, nerves and how to address those and things like that. But I guess it's different when you're putting your actual life on the line, because when I go into a jujitsu competition, I'm not really thinking so much about, you know, the, the chances of me dying are extremely low. The chances of injury are, I guess, moderate. But, you know, when you're going on the job and you've guys, you know, you've got a game plan, you got weapons and there's a bad guy who does not want to go to jail, does not want to die. The risks associated are much higher. I, I'd love to hear how you sort of how you base your mindset around uh, going into something like that day in, day out. Yeah. And I think just as a disclaimer, because I know a lot of your a lot of your patrons and a lot, a lot of your listeners are, um, you know, educated people that are inclined to research and like to have things sourced. Just a few things I should mention before we start the episode. So this episode kind of came together. First of all, we are going to touch on interpersonal human aggression, which is a very, very complex and disputed field, I, I should say. There are some theories and there are some of the the concepts that are widely accepted, but there is evidently always another side to the coin or, or, or another theory. And, and some of this stuff is actually extremely difficult to to put together in a way that, okay, we know 100% that this is the case. So a lot of the information that I will share with you today without regurgitating um, the work of a variety of different great people in this field, uh, there will be a reference to a book called On Combat uh, about the physiology and psychology of, of basically a deadly conflict. There is also a reference to On Killing, which is from the same author, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, who just so happened to be a Ranger Battalion commander, as well as a psychologist and a West Point professor. And for those of you who don't know, West Point is the epitome of, of military university. A lot of people much, much smarter than me have graduated from there. There is also a variety of training experiences and operational experiences that are going to come in there. There's also increasing sort of team collective resilience over over the years to send the guys into difficult situation, critical incidents, and have them come back and actually perform the task again and again and again and mitigating occupational stress injuries or PTSD. And because ultimately what, what ends up happening is 
those guys don't only go to one call or two calls and it's not like okay i had two big calls in my career and they're really hard to deal with is no i have a really big call to go to and then next week i have another one and the week after i have another one and so it's important that you can have a sustainable model that keeps the guys healthy the entire time so a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about some of the works the work that i did for post-critical incident care a lot of the information will come from there as well. And there's a variety of other sources. And what we can do, Matt, as I was mentioning earlier, is we can source some of this stuff and some of the literature, maybe, you know, on the website or in your Discord chat or whatever the case may be, if your people are interested in kind of digging a little bit further into this. Cool. So how many years have you had in the force? Two decades uh, I'm running now? up to I'm running up to 20 here in March. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you want to go over first? Well, uh, I suppose we can start with what area are we going to focus on, right? So there are uh, various types of aggression. So we, we know there are accidental, expressive, instrumental, and hostile. And we're going to talk about hostile aggression or, you know, the true meaning of aggression. It's not like I'm walking down when I wake up in the morning, bang my toe in the bed and start swearing loudly. And I scare my wife or my kid because I'm accidentally aggressive. We're going to talk about interpersonal human aggression with hostile intent right. type deal and the reactions that that causes and and how much of a universal phobia that is really. Or ev everybody feels like they notice aggression from other people just as a sort of a natural, we were discussing almost like a self-defense mechanism and how that can be perceived person to person, situation to situation, whether it's you're on the job or whether I'm in a jujitsu tournament or whether I'm at the bar and you know you someone's posturing on you and then you sense danger right yeah i mean everybody feels it probably not but a majority of people i, I believe the sort of documented that it is worse than the fear of height or a fear of darkness which are two very there is a lot of people there is a lot of people that that have those two phobias and and and, and interpersonal human aggression or human conflicts actually creates more of a fear in in humans at a, or at a at a higher rate than those two and there are there are claims out there that even those two combine so i don't know how how accurate the statement is but it just goes to show that and i think that's something we just don't speak about in general right but i mean there is and and the reasons for that are extremely nebulous and they're also disputed why is it that we have such an adverse reaction to interpersonal human conflict. And one of the theory that to me holds a candle at, at the very least has to do with a primal makeup that allows the species to survive. Because if we didn't have that and we started essentially self-destructing or, or fighting amongst each other to the death, how long would the species survive and, and, and how, how adverse would that have an effect on a, on a, on a species, right? Mm -hmm. There is a lot of empirical and there's a lot of evidence to support that suggestion and i i tend to i tend to believe that it makes a lot of sense uh, i don't know if it is i don't know if it is the case but it makes a lot of sense certainly it's interesting like so if we if we were to talk about um, how this manifests itself um, you know we can take something as simple as uh, say you're in a lineup at the bank and somebody butts in front of you in the lineup and now you have to tell that people, you have to, you know, for lack of better terms, you have to confront that people and say, hey, the line is back there, or excuse me, sir, you know, the, the line is behind me type deal. And you see people do that and they're shaking, right? They're experiencing an adrenaline dump. There's a hormonal change going on. Their heart rate is accelerating. There's some, you know, there's likely some blood pooling and some, sometimes their face turned flush and, and red or, or, or white because the blood's pooling in the ma major organs. Like there is actually a physiological reaction. Like, listen, you're not in a, you're not in a gunfight here. You're not in a knife fight. You're not in a, you're not in a deadly conflict. But what you are is asking a person to go back in line. Yeah. Somebody you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. What kind of a day they're having, what their personality is or or how aggressive they are naturally. But still, you have to, like you said, put them back in line or sort of remind them of society's how we interact with each other. And then that kind of opens up a door for a reaction of conflict, I guess. No, it does. And, and I guess the point I was making there is that oftentimes you will see people, their voice will be crackling and you can see they're breathing harder and all this stuff. And this is a very, very benign scenario where there's really no 
there's a very small risk of violence, if anything. And most of the time, the person that did that couldn't even handle themselves, but it still created that stress response. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Do you think, do you think that between, and, and again, I don't want to get, get anyone in trouble here, but do you think that, um, like men are more susceptible than women to this effect or women are more susceptible to, uh, this effect than men? Or do you think it's pretty even across the board, the average person? Well, that's kind of interesting. I guess it depends who you ask. Probably safe to say that men may have um, more aggression, more of a more of a dog in the in the fight. Uh, also, men have the posturing gene. You know, we've been perfecting that for many, many <laughs> centuries, <laughs> yeah. millenniums, really. I think I think from what I've seen, generally, you know, just just from my own experiences, men are are generally quicker to be more aggressive without. I guess, thinking about the, uh, every card in front of them before they act. And yes, I do agree that women can generally avoid conflict better. But I've also seen some girls out there who, <laughs> whether it's uh, influenced by alcohol or just their personality, they're also quick to to be aggressive. So it is it is pretty it's probably pretty common across the whole board. But um, generally, I think I think we can all agree that men are aggressors more in nature than women are. Yeah, at the very least, we know that it affects both genders the same way, right? Like in terms of uh, physical response, in terms of physical and psychological response. Mm -hmm. So I guess then it, it sort of brings us into some of the historical misconception. And I think I think most humans understood the concept of fight or flight. You know, like there, there are two yeah. human, there are two human expected reactions, which are going to be you're going to either fight or basically run your way out of a out of a tight spot when confronted with interpersonal human aggression but i think clearly a misconception there are others posturing is one of the very common one and submitting is also a very common one and that's pretty alarming because there are some pretty scary sort of statistics out there showing the numbers pretty elevated numbers of people that would actually not kill if their life depended on it and that is evidently a massive risk but it i mean it's good news from a you know humanoid stand, standpoint it's good news because people are just going out there unless they're psychopath uh, they're not going out there willing to kill in a heartbeat and has to be trained into people to do it so professionally trained into people to do it if their job might require it but certainly it's also concerning that if your life was at risk and you were what you did was the difference between living and dying, I would expect that you would make the call and do what you have to do. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, how do you how do you think that affects you? Let's say or do you think it, it makes a difference? Let's say now if you have your kid with you. Uh, you know, you're you're with your child or two childs or, or your wife or whatever or your husband and then a conflict happens. And now not not only do you have your own well-being to look after, but you have your family as well, because for me, that I think would <laughs> that would make me more. I don't know if aggressive is the word, but I would be willing to definitely kill more <laughs> if I had if I had my, uh, you know, my kids with me because. Um, it's not just you at risk now. Now it's it's someone else, you know, if and and things things change, because if you are if you are going one on one with someone and there's no one else to worry about, well, that's kind of a, an even situation. But what if, you know, your kids are there? What if there's two on one, but you you've got your kid there and now, you know, you can't be grappling and fighting and whatever. Well, while your kid is there unprotected, it's just not a smart strategy uh, all the time. So how do you think that? If, do you think? that affects you if you have loved ones with you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I Or even your teammates, right? Like if you're if you're out on a call and you have teammates who are literally loved ones, you know, they're your they're your training partners, they're your uh, teammates and brothers or what uh, whatever, you know, it probably has the exact same uh sentimental effect. Yeah, it it speaks to it's essentially what it speaks to is purpose, right? And what is the purpose if you're taking an action, what what purpose is it co correlated to? And uh, and saying I, I'm willing to to make a very difficult call on my account, people are have less of a tendency to be what's the word drastic in their decision making process. Versus if my kids are here and my kids are potentially next on in the line or they're potentially threatened by whatever I'm faced with, we as parents and I think everybody 
who has kids can relate to this, uh, will generally have a much, much easier time taking drastic actions quickly. And, um, and, but again, this also, as you mentioned, Matt, it, it also translates into making some decisions with respect to protecting the lives of your teammates, of your peers, of the, of the members of the public. What it comes down to ultimately is what is the purpose and what needs to be done. But when you, when you take in consideration the training techniques and the tactics and procedures that are being used, uh, say at a law enforcement level or in the military, uh, in the military field, then you are looking at professionally induced response, which are also tied in some of the primal reactions that we would have, but we steer that so we can, we can essentially achieve a desirable outcome with some predictable response to a stimuli. Yeah. And I guess, I guess what we could discuss is sort of how do you train that into someone whether it's at the law enforcement level or the military level, um, because like you said, you know, if you've ever had a conflict with someone at the grocery store over a parking space or whatever, you know, the way you talked about it, how you start shaking sometimes or, you know, you're, you feel like a head rush or you get that adrenaline dump that becomes the uh, reactions are so physical in nature that it does need to sort of be trained into you to make clear decisions in such a stressful environment. So how what are some of the things that you can do, uh, you know, speaking from your experience to train that into individuals? Yeah, that's that's a very, very complex field when it comes to training. But I can give you some examples. So generally what will happen is there will be a hands and feet set of skills being trained, right? So we're going to talk about, um, I mean, aside from the legal side and the de-escalation side or the, the verbal judo side of all these things are also tied into this. But there will be evidently the, the, the hands and feet such as the shooting, the driving, the, the fighting, whether it's a, 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 you know, edged weapon or, or empty handed or, or, or BJJ or whatever, whatever medium or whatever training tool you use, then there will be um, reality based scenario or, or scenario based training that is conducted, uh, and we call it blue on blue on force on force, basically where you have an actual bad guy and you have weapon system that are provided to you that are exactly like yours, except in there is bullets with detergent in them. You know, it's kind of like paintball, but a little bit more sophisticated and a little less fun. And then you will be introduced to some realistic scenarios in which you are going to have to exhibit the, you know, the right behaviors and, and rehearse, primarily rehearse mm-hmm. and drive those mechanisms, those response mechanisms inside your, uh, sort of your, your natural reaction. So, so that when it actually happened and your, your heart rate goes, shoots up to, you know, 110, 115, 140, 160, 170, where there's some degradation of skills, degradation, degradation of, um, of, uh, of fine motor skills of, of the complex skills are kind of going out and you're turning more into a, a reactive caveman, you know, type deal. You have those built in sort of core training standard SOPs, tactics, whatever you want to call them that will be easily or more easily retained and more easily executed uh, when high stress kicks in. But with that, there's also the psychological component to this, which again is, you know, and again, very complex field, but stress inoculation through repeated practice, there's some rewarding behaviors. So if you you know, for example, you do really well in the scenario, then, you know, you, you, there's some attaboys or there's some, you know, just to reinforce a positive reinforcement that, hey, if something was done that needed uh, some work or that something was done that was critical, that could have been deadly or could have been, there's there's an idea that we're going to basically reset and redo and sort of get you to win, right, at all cost and, um and, and you can still learn and you can still get a lot from all the uh, scenarios that you're running, even if you're making mistakes, especially if you're making mistakes through debriefing and r- looking at what you did and what you missed and mm-hmm. how, did, how did you not open your tunnel vision and all these other things. And we can sort of get that. Yeah. Yeah. So so what I take away from this and uh, it, it's it's interesting because my mind immediately goes to. Uh, what's going on right now with current event stuff that's going on. 
immediately my mind goes there when I think about, uh, you know, high stress situations, making decisions, whether it's me at the grocery store or whether it's police on a call or whatever. Uh, but, but it sounds to me like this sort of stress inoculation training and this ability to use logic and make, you know, smart decisions in a blink of an eye in high stress situations, it's not something that can really be learned once. It's a skill that needs to be continuously honed. You know, imagine you do BJJ for a month and then you stop completely. And now, okay, now you, now you are whatever, a one stripe white belt or you do, you know, you get your blue belt and then you're like, okay, I stop now. And then you're training. Eventually it fades away. The skills reverse. It's something that needs to be honed and, and worked on constantly. So when I think about like, you know, uh, police and, and the use of force and things like that, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for police officers just essentially learning how to be better fighters. Because if you think about the job of a policeman, um, you know, maybe it wasn't always considered this way, but we're seeing now with all the, you know, everyone's got a camera phone and all this stuff that's going on is that, you know, if a, if a lot of these cops really knew how to break someone's alignment, how to be a better fighter, how to, how to grapple and not just like they did some grappling or they, they had some street fights in their youth, but they are constantly honing these skills as part of their continuous training. And so that, uh, you know, they, they're constantly improving in that area. That is something that is, um, you know, it's, it's not just like I learn it once and okay, I've got this skill now. It is, it is a never ending journey. And if you sort of stop training those areas, then it becomes difficult again. You, you know, you lose that stress inoculation training. So, um, on what's going on right now and all this scrutiny towards the police, how important do you think it is for police to know how to, how to fight? How to actually, you know, they say, oh, they need to have de-escalation. I agree with all this. But when when it comes time to actually control a suspect, to be able to wrestle, to be able to grapple, to understand how to get a, get a grown person to the ground and not have to just resort to a weapon right away. How like what is your thoughts on that? Well, as I stated before, I, the best fight we can get into is the fight we're now getting into at, as law enforcement. I've repeated this on several podcasts, and, and I think everybody understands that. But we also understand that it comes a time where there just isn't a choice. Mm -hmm. And when that choice is no longer yours and, and, and the circumstances are forced upon you to now make a decision and make a call, it is critical that you have the knowledge based and the practice to do it. And you're absolutely right, Matt. It, they are perishable skills. And I would say that they perish a lot faster than we give them credit for too. I mean, just skip the mats for a week and then yeah. you come back in class and you feel rusty. Just imagine if your training is once every three or four months. It, just imagine if your training is once a year and imagine if your training is once every three years. And, and not just that, but imagine, imagine the consequence of you failing is not getting submitted, but it's now a hand to hand situation where it could be your life on the line. It could be a suspect's life on the line. And no matter what happens, you're under the microscope at this point. So, you know, any, any error that can be made in this situation could be recorded. It could be, you could find yourself in the headlines, you know, there's going to be people out there that disagree. But right now I, I look at the job of a police officer and I'm like, man, like who would want that job at this point? Like it would be extremely difficult to have to do your job and then you get put into a situation like you discussed where you literally don't have a choice. You, you've you tried to de-escalate, you've tried, you've tried to do everything you can and the suspect is not cooperating and now they're getting physical, now they're closing the distance and now you have to use force and you know that there's really no way around this. Yeah, a lot of cops are telling their kids to be firefighters now. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it's interesting. One of the most difficult sort of thing that we can that we can do as law enforcement is is make those split second decisions based on what we think we know at the time, based on the totality of the circumstances, and. <laughs> What will happen ultimately is is it will be looked at by people that have six months to look at it. And after six months of de deliberation, this is the decision that should have been made. Except when I did it, it was 38 seconds and I had to make all this assessment, yeah. you know, uh, and, and a lot of the a lot of the issues that we have in policing are based on the fact that we really cannot demonstrate what didn't happen. Right. So it's easy to look after and say, OK, somebody got hurt. But yeah. what would have happened if that person didn't or how was that call lining up to be and who was going to be on the losing end of this? And of course, when people think 
fighting or, or arresting a suspect, they, they somehow have this concept in their heads that we are paid to do that and that that should be a fair process. Well, it's not the case at all. Like we, we are paid to win, not paid to fight, right? Yeah. And so, and so there's always if the force presented or if there is a if there's a the totality of circumstances requires a certain level of force, it a doesn't need to be measured with exactitude. And the courts have been very very clear on that. It is very difficult to do under stressful circumstances. It is also very difficult to do when you're missing information, right? So. Not only are we not required to to um, use a force or to measure measure the force with exactitude, but along with that is we have to do it on account of what we think is occurring, which, of course, if it turns out not to be the case, then it's easy to look back and reverse engineer it and say, OK, well, based on what we know, this was the right decision to do, mm-hmm. which is, of course, the, the wrong way to do it because you didn't know that. Right. So it's yeah. it's it's tough. It's not easy. But with that, if you have your members uh, well trained if you have them well uh, competent in in all areas of use of force then you also give them a self confidence you also it also shines through them and there is a, a, you know a lot of empirical evidence through force science and through other bodies uh, researching bodies interviewing suspects saying hey what what happened here and why did you kill this officer and it, you know he was sloppy his kit looked all he was disheveled. He, his boots were, you know, untied, and his belt was dangling, and and he looked like he didn't, he, they couldn't take care of business, and I, it was an insult for me to be arrested by this guy. So I ended up killing him. Uh, versus the, alternatively, a lot of suspects have said this guy looked squared away. He looked, you know, he looked like a Navy SEAL. You know, he was in shape. Not that they have to look like a Navy SEAL, but the, those. This is a one specific example that was used, saying this guy was in shape. He, you know, he. he Clearly was taking care of himself, his, his, his belt was all tight and everything, his kit was all well positioned and his position was very, you know, he, he was ready to his access all his tools, good. his posture was good. <laughs> no, precisely. I mean, and, 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 and that in itself is a deterrent. So it's not only that it actually affects their ability to conduct their daily operation, but it also prevents use of force in general by mm-hmm. having, you know, the, the, the professional kind of aura around them, if that makes yeah. any sense. We were discussing before the show fear versus anxiety. I, I like the way that you sort of differentiated the two. Would you like to go into that? Yeah, sure. So I guess, and certainly I don't own this, but uh, the definition, you know, might be worded a little bit differently. But essentially what it says is is that fear is generally reality-based. You know, there's, there's a stimuli, it, it induces some fear. And it's there and I can observe it or there's observable, you know, there's some symptomology and, and, and it creates a fear, which is, you know, real. And then you, you start looking at anxiety and anxiety is more something that it's kind of your mind playing tricks on you, right? Like your fear and doubts and insecurities all wrapped up into one package and it associates this to an event that's forthcoming. So an event that's coming in the future, which the future isn't even time. Yeah. Like there is no such thing as the future, right? We're only the only species that can actually look in the future. But we, it is interesting that all my insecurities, my doubt, everything packaged into one thing, which I apply in a time frame that doesn't even exist. So it's it's less based in reality. And that's mm-hmm. kind of the, you know, the one thing that has to be put under control for future calls, right? If you are to. Yeah. So. This is something that we I discussed with Travis Stevens, who was recently on our podcast. Again, Travis Stevens, go check out that episode. He's just, you know, judo silver medalist at the Olympic Games. He's fantastic grappler, black belt in jiu-jitsu under John Danaher as well. And one of the questions I had for him was, you know, okay, on competition day, how do you address your nerves and your anxiety and, you know, uh, the adrenaline dump and things like that? And he said... He has over the years had a variety of different approaches. You know, he's um, visu- visualization and, and uh, he's gone through imagining, uh, you know, tying up or whatever with the guy and he, visualizing getting your hand raised and all this stuff. But then he said he also had some some negative effects from just doing that. So he and I think I think in the episode he was talking about how he over warmed up one of, uh, you know, one of the tournaments or whatever, and he was warming up and then he found that he was, he was warming up for so long that he was actually becoming exhausted now. 
And I, I said, you know, so you look at some of these high level grapplers in the bullpen right before they go out on the mat. Sometimes you could be in the bullpen for 20 minutes. Sometimes you can be in there for an hour or even longer. Right. Uh, and a lot of the high level guys, you don't see them in there doing burpees and doing crazy calisthenics. They're very calm. They're very careful about expending energy and, uh, you know, their their mental bandwidth. Right. You don't want to overstress your mind before before going out there when you want to compete your best. And he was saying, well, he overexerted himself and he had negative results in the competition. And so he came home and sort of started seeing a sports psychologist. The sports psychologist said, OK, instead of imagining you know, what you're going to do to this guy and, you know, oh, you, you got to, you got to win this competition and, and, and visualizing yourself winning. He's the sports psychologist said, okay, I want you to think about what it feels like when you think about this competition, you feel your heart jump into your throat. How does it feel like when you step onto the mats? What does the tatami feel like? What does the tape on your fingers feel like? Okay. Now you're a minute into the match and imagine the worst adrenaline dump you can feel. Your head is spinning and it feels like you you know your head's a balloon and your your eyes are kind of like you can feel that pressure behind your eyeballs your throat is dry and sore and your lungs are burning like what are these feelings and how can you essentially program them into your mind and uh you know something Josh Waitskin talks about which is essentially create a trigger where you can feel this moment so that when it, when the moment happens you're used to it and you can make better decisions in that moment of stress so is that something that you sort of go over go over with your guys do you think that that's a good approach in the law enforcement situation as well as in competition yeah absolutely it is and 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 there's there's a variety of reasons for that but the primary reason is if you focus on the outcome and the outcome is lining up to be what the outcome should be or what the desirable outcome should be panic can set in if panic sets in you have an increased reaction to stress and now you're you're basically defeating the purpose because now you get more stressed out during a critical incident and guess what happens you're actually degrading right so your skill set everything degrades so <laughs> so in in, in jujitsu let's just say in what you just said if we were going to tie that back into a competition would that be the panic of like the fear of okay what if i fuck up what if this guy what what if this guy does something to me that i'm not ready for and now i'm down or now i'm in a bad position like cuz that fear can kill you that fear can can lead you down bad areas and instead of worrying about like what they're going to do to you you need to worry about what you're going to do to them right is that sort of the same idea yeah i mean just think about Think of it in terms of like, okay, so you and I grapple for the first time. We don't know anything about each other. And we just having a little friendly match on a training day. And um, in the first 30 seconds of the match, I swept you twice. You have effectively really difficult for you to win that match from now on for two reasons. A, I've built up my confidence, which makes makes me incredibly dangerous. And I know that I have a skill set. If I was able to sweep you in two seconds, I'm probably technically better or so I think anyways, but likely you are. And uh, it doesn't mean there is an, an area of expertise that you have that you may be able to exploit later during the match. And it actually doesn't mean I'm going to win this match. But this is what happens. And what happens to you inversely is you now start start doubting yourself because you got already swept twice. And wow, this guy's good and he's fast and he's strong or he's technical or whatever the case may be. So that's why when you when the, the focal point is the outcome and the outcome it diverts from the plan. It's incredibly, incredibly um, damaging for yeah. an athlete. And, you're, and I guess you're not really making decisions in the moment. You're more thinking like, it's it's kind of like if I go into a match and be like, okay, I just got to get past this. I got to get the first match out of the way so I can focus on my recovery for my second match. And and you're already, you're already kind of looking past the first opponent when really what you need to do is think second to second and kind of address dress problems as they come and if you do it that way you'll i feel like i grapple much more in the moment and the decisions are much clearer my goals become clearer and it's easier for me to stay in that offensive cycle but if like if you sweep me and pass me or you sweep me i get up again and then you know you pull and sweep me right again it's like man this guy can sweep me from everywhere and now my confidence starts to fade i start to doubt myself um, and I'm not really making sound decisions anymore. I'm stuck in a defensive cycle and you're pushing the tempo. So definitely, I think when we talk about momentum shifts in all aspects of fighting, this is one of the worst things that a, a competitor can feel. And a lot of the time that can happen when you're just not living in the moment and you're not making sound decisions. So that's one of the things that I think 
a lot of people can do is like understand what are our clear goals and let's let's address each goal as they come rather than thinking about like okay i'm gonna complete the mission or okay i'm gonna win the championship or whatever because now we're not really thinking about how we're gonna do it we're just thinking about putting that on the pedestal and and that is our focus rather than how do we actually build a a feasible path to to reach the goal yeah, Matt, and it's interesting. One of one of the uh, one of the areas that we saw this a lot uh, is on the firearms range, and the firearms range creates can create a lot of stress, especially on qualification days. And I was on a course with some special operation uh, unit, and I was speaking to one of the psych- their unit psychologists, and she was telling me that what would happen during a certain take it specialty course to train those specialist those special operators what would happen is they drilled drawing their pistols out of their holsters and 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 presenting them setting them and delivering accurate shots repeatedly over and over and over to the point where they were you know delivering accurate rounds in so quickly and so precisely and then they would take the same sorry i kind of went on a tangent here but they would take the same guys and put them in scenario based training and then they would have them do the same over and over again and they would be delivering rounds and from all angles and never thinking about how this process occurs because it was driven into them and it was now hardwired into them there was no way there was no reason for matt Quan to worry about or for whoever the special operator was to worry about how quickly that pistol was going to come out of that holster because they just mastered an aspect of the game and then they would go into qualification and the guys would start thinking about how am i going to get my pistol out in time and she's like okay listen we're going to have she's a sports psychologist and she's a you know dedicated to unit she understands the job and everything spoke to the guys and said look i never want you to worry about taking your pistol out of your holster we've already that's like a, a sailed ship type deal you don't have to think about that this is the type of stuff that matt Quan doesn't have to worry about like matt Quan doesn't have to worry about his his base or his posture because this is conceptually what you do on the daily so if you start doubting that you may be out you know you may it just it just yeah. doesn't work it's like worry about the things worry about the process but don't get treated by a chihuahua you know type deal yeah it's almost as if it's, it's almost as if i i'm really good at doing an arm bar from the close guard and that's great i can i can do that i can i can get to my close guard and do it but what if my opponent gives me a reaction that i'm not accustomed to and now i i can see that that arm bar is not really going to work or whatever particular technique is not going to work because of my opponent's body positioning it's like i can't be worrying about how am i going to do this arm bar under this circumstance i need to be i think i think if i'm not mistaken you're talking about like having having your key understanding of of what's going on that base level is already set so that you can sort of make decisions that are uh, based on your opponent's reactions because if you're just if i'm just focused on like okay i've done this arm bar 100 times i'm just going to do this arm bar uh, and then i start thinking okay well i can't do my arm bar anymore like it's not working uh and then all of a sudden you go down this path where you're you're now on the defense and things are not working i need to ha- i need to know that i can i can do what i can do and then whatever my opponent gives me as a reaction i need to be able to adapt and and address that specific scenario not just get so caught up on you know, the thing that I've done a hundred times or in another example would be like, I'm overthinking something that I, I should know how to do. And as a result, I'm now falling behind in general. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it, it does. And it and it affects your self-confidence and the biggest and that's one of the biggest sort of impediment to performance is, is for you to start doubting yourself. And I was talking to you, Matt, earlier about the negative bias in humans, right? Like we we have that ingrained in us. So so the key is and you were talking about visualization and we can tie that we can sort of tie that into visualization but preparing a game plan and having put the proper mat time prior to the, the you know the tournament or competition or the match that you have and having rehearsed at nauseum you know over and over again those basic principles and then taking your visualization in a different at a different level, but not focusing on outcome, focusing on the process, but focusing on the things that we know are major impediment to performance, lack of confidence or loss of confidence during a match or being tired, as you mentioned earlier, Matt, those, you know, those kinds of things. So if I'm doing visualization, I'm going to be visualizing 
I'm not going to be worried about the jiu-jitsu aspect of it. I'm going to be rolling with whatever comes my way, but I'm going to be focusing mm. on the things that have the potential to creep into my mind and make me less performant. And yeah. that definitely needs to be visualized um, deeply. And one of the ways to do that there and people know about visualization. OK, I just, you know, visualize myself winning and visualize this. But it goes far beyond that. You can take it four level deeper. You can visualize. And I had a uh, psychologist do that with me again on, a, on one of the courses, resilience course that I was on. And it was OK. You know, for us, it was like an entry on a, in a stronghold where we were looking for someone that was, you know, a dangerous offender and we were going to have. Uh, problems with them so we enter a room shots are fired i'm hit multiple times you know and she really painted a picture like a horrible picture in a, a horrible set of circumstances that definitely could induce a doubt in my mind like am i dying here i'm shot six times or whatever the case maybe i see my own blood and i can feel it and it's and it's what she did is she actually went into i want you to feel what it feels like to bleed i want you to feel what it feels like mm -hmm. when you're having a hard time breathing and you're you have labored breathing but you're still going through and you're you know you you return fire in an accurate manner and you hit and it you know and 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 it takes multiple shots but you're winning and you know that kind of stuff so what we did is essentially by the time i was done with that visualization exercise i had been there i'd felt it mm -hmm. i'd smelt it i you know literally every sense was engaged in this and one of the most powerful training tools that we have and one of the most effective tools that we have is to use the subconscious mind so i've i've spoken about this before we're humans we're 90 percent emotions but we think that we are we are cerebral because 10% of the time we're on a conscious mind and we're making decisions with our heads. So we think that because that is the conscious mind that we actually are more conscious than we're emotionally driven and it's the other way around. So what happens is the subconscious mind really doesn't have a concept of reality. It's just either been there or hasn't. Mm -hmm. So you can create these extremely realistic scenarios in your mind and reinforce them to training and rehearsal and what will come out of that is when you find yourself in that scenario the mind isn't going to say yeah but that was just training the mind will say i've been here before i know how to overcome this i can win so those are training tools that are very very effective for us yeah it sounds a lot like what travis was talking about and just visualizing like okay don't visualize if it's judo uh, we're moving our feet and now i i hit my favorite technique and i get my pawn and i win the match it's like don't visualize you as the victor visualize you in a bad situation or visualize you going against a tough opponent and now things aren't going your way and you're getting absolutely exhausted like what does it feel like to to your heart is pounding through your chest and you still have to, you, you know, you still have to do judo. You still have to make decisions and you still have to uh, fight through it. And, and the match is maybe only one minute in and you're, you know, you're fighting for your life and you're getting tuned up on the feet. Like, how can you overcome that? And how can you how can you return offense when you're absolutely exhausted? Your lungs are burning. So I really like the physical aspect of like putting yourself there into a position where you are not in your element, but where you're, you're kind of down, right? It's almost like a, it's like a mental training handicap. You know, we spoke before the episode about target sparring out of bad positions. Like that could be a, a jujitsu example of this, where you're in a bad position, like mount or someone's on your back and you got to fight your way out because it's a, it, you know, it's one of the worst positions you can be in or one tool that I love, you know, and I actually have an Airdyne bike because of you, because uh, I after working with you, I, I liked it so much I had to buy one. But I love going on there and just like getting, you know, burning 20 calories fast as you can and then going right into a competition situation with the guys or, you know, maybe you're getting shark tanked. And uh, when the timer goes, there's already a guy on your back before the other guy relieves the position. So you're just constantly fighting for your life in these stressful situations. And I think that's, a, as a competitor, one of the best ways you can sort of temper that stress inoculation so that it's it's not like you can ever really get, a, get rid of it. Um, and I don't know if it would be a wise decision to actually get rid of it. I think it's it's something that you can use, right? Sort of live in it rather than try to avoid it. Because if you avoid it, that's where you can get caught off guard and, and then sh things go really sideways. It's actually something that uh, GSP has a book. I think it's called My Fight, Your Fight. And he talks about how fear can totally be your enemy. You know, if you if you fear fear and you try to avoid fear and you dread fear, then you're, you're just, you know, you're going to hate going into competition. You're going to hate when the chips are down. But if you 
can use fear to harness uh, strength and motivate you, then it's actually a very powerful ally. So it's a it's a it's it's a good way, I think, to sort of visualize things when when they go wrong and how does your body feel? What are your physical what are the physical reactions that you're feeling during these situations? And then that way, when you go into the match, it's much more calming and you can make the decisions and you know, OK, well, I, I, I don't need to worry about this guy pouring the pressure on me and me being exhausted. I know it's going to happen. It's just now I'm more accustomed to it. Now I can actually I can live with that and I'm going to I'm going to live and breathe in that. Yes. And if you have a purpose and you have a process and you have put in the work, you know, fear becomes uh, irrelevant, really. Uh, courage isn't not having fear. Courage is doing things despite the presence of fear. And I think, you know, if you are absolutely not fearful of a situation or if you absolutely have no apprehension about this situation, there is one of two things. You're either uber stress inoculated by virtue of having been there so often and i'm pretty sure megaton diaz doesn't get stressed for any tournaments i could be wrong i've seen him do like heavyweight adult this year in oregon the dude is like 155 and he's like 50 or something that dude does not get scared he doesn't give a i think i think he just doesn't care if he wins or loses he's just gonna go out there and He's been there so many times. He's like, fuck it. Let's just do it. Right. So, yeah, he I don't think he does get afraid <laughs> or maybe he does. But he's just like, I realize that this is part of it and I'm going to make it my friend. Uh, the fear is not something to to dread. The fear is like, you know, that's where I live type thing. I tell you, though, having experienced his tornado sweep from the inside, <laughs> you get nice view from there. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it's a funny story. Um, Megaton D has a purple belt and I, I showed up to his club and there's a brown belt and he's obviously one of his competitor. And we had a, a you know, quite the little battle for because they do 10 minute rounds. And of course, I wasn't doing 10 minute rounds at the time because who does anyway? <laughs> but it was good. So we had a good uh, sort of back and forth. And then I see Megaton, he's in his... Um, in his sweats and all of a sudden he goes back there puts the gi on comes back out mac dern is sitting there watching the whole thing i'm flipping up and <laughs> up in the air everywhere and uh and yeah it was a long 10 minutes i can tell you that and to make matters worse my girlfriend was watching and she's like realizing that i'm not all i'm cracked up to be and <laughs> <laughs> actually that's interesting it's kind of like what we talked about earlier where where if a loved one is with you how that can affect your mindset because you know, when I'm in a competition, if I have people that I care about or people who look up to me, whether it's like my kids or my family or my students, it's like, well, you feel the pressure more. It's a little bit different than if you're just by yourself. Right. It kind of changes your mindset. It might even motivate you more. It's like it's like when uh, someone comes to the school and then they bring their girl with them. It's like I'm always a little bit more like, oh, God, is he going to try and like pour it on a little bit more because he feels like he needs to show dominance in front of his partner or whatever. But that brings a really good point, Matt, and, and, and the point of ego, right? So ego, a certain, a certain amount of ego is good and it, and it uh, pushes you to excel and it pushes you to want to do better and want to perform. And that's what essentially got you there in the first place. Um, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. When ego becomes destructive, that's where the issue is, right? So if, if the person is, you know, three weeks away from the tournament and the only thing they can focus on is the outcome and what's going to happen is now you have a bigger problem or I don't want to go out there and embarrass myself, do all this stuff. Hey, I've known guys that had some really, really poor showing in tournaments for 22 tournaments in a row. And on number 23, they started showing up. That's what it took them to, to, to you know, to kind of get over some of the jitters, some of the anxiety, some of the, but, but all the power to them for going out there and competing 22 times, not caring about what anybody said, what anybody thought. They just knew yeah. if I stick to this and, you know, not to put him under the gun, but I mean, Jason Gagnon was one of the best gi guy, you know, in the country, arguably, you know, he was ranked number two as a brown belt in the world in 2015. I mean, a, a Cabrina black belt and a fantastic competitor was very, very, very nervous in his, in his sort of, you know, initial, when he started competing initially. And, um, and he just pushed through as many tournaments as he possibly could. And again, reached a level of stress inoculation, which really paid dividend in the end and, and led him to where he is now. But I think having the ability to, to, 
to curb one one's ego to to get that done is critical is, is absolutely critical yeah and for those who don't know jason gagnon is actually my first jiu-jitsu coach back in the west coast days he was a purple belt just a fresh purple belt when i started um and he was one of the guys that i looked up to coming up and of course seb and i have trained with him uh extensively he's the head owner of uh genesis actually no like uh, cobrina vancouver, vancouver yeah. now uh, out in abbotsford about 50 minutes away from us here but yeah that's a great example of someone who you know even even if uh and i can attest to this too like i now that i'm a black belt i don't honestly i don't win a lot of tournaments anymore especially in the gi um you know gi is not really my specialty anymore i've definitely become more of a nogi guy but uh, i got i got a match a month away from here and it's against a guy who is a, a very strong gi player and i consider myself better at nogi i consider myself knowledgeable in leg locks like my style is more accustomed to that from what i've seen he's more of a gi guy and plays more lapel games so it's it's a very interesting clash of styles Going into this match, I'm fully expecting to, even though I, I feel like maybe I'm more knowledgeable on some things, like I expect to not get my way. I'm expecting to go in there and and to try and enter his legs and things are not going to work for me. So it's like, if I have the feeling like, oh, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to I'm gonna pull guard right away. I'm going to get into a cross ash. I'm going to heel hook him and that's how it's going to go. And I'm going to get my hand raised. It's like, yeah, well what if things don't go that way what if he what if we what if we shake hands and he jumps guard on me and now he's got closed guard he's got these long ass legs he's gonna wrap his legs around me and I'm trapped inside his closed guard it's like fuck this is not where I want to be if I don't if I don't consider that this is a possibility that could happen then I'm gonna be really scrambling and I'm gonna be surprised on game day right it's like a lot of I've gone into tournaments being like okay I'm gonna pull guard and I go in, the guy, boom, jumps guard on me. And now I'm in someone's closed guard. It's like, God damn, this is, this is like one of the worst things ever. I do not want to be in this position. So how can we like, you know, you can't really ever get your way. You have to be able to adapt on the fly in these stressful situations. And you have to think about these things beforehand so that when it happens, it's like, okay, I'm not worried. I'm just, I need to address things as they come. And I can't let, you know, if this person gets guard before I do, and, and, you know, in a way that's, that's kind of a loss in my eyes. Well, I need to make sure that I'm not losing confidence and I'm not falling down a, a pit of despair because now I'm going to, it's going to affect my performance. It's going to affect, you know, my, the decisions that I do make. No, I love it. And, and a lot of these kinks can be worked out in a gym, right? And in one of the areas, and, and Matt, I don't know if you know this, but I competed uh, quite a bit as a white, blue and early purple. And that's kind of where it stops. It stopped for me. I had some very mixed results. I had some, some good results. I would say decent results because there's no high level tournament in my, in it sort of in my journey. Um, they were, you know, decent. I mean, um, ADCC regional in Seattle was decent, I guess. But, uh, but anyways, uh, I've had most of the time, if I've had some issues in tournaments of, of either getting tired or exhausted or using too much power, not enough technique. Well, there was a few reasons for this. My jujitsu wasn't where my jujitsu needed to be. The training, the training wasn't put in the way it should have been. You know, I don't deflect responsibility, but as a white belt, I expect that if you are an instructor or if you're a coach in jujitsu, you should be having these conversations yeah. with these guys and say, Hey man, you're not putting the mat time necessary. Your technique isn't where it needs to be. All those things but all i was told is absolutely nothing right so as a white yeah. belt not knowing i'm like well you just show up in a tournament completely unprepared and add to this you know in a 60 70 hour week uh, training week, uh, working week rather and uh, and a difficult job or working night shifts and doing all those things i was setting myself up for failure once you're set for failure and you actually go and fail it's really difficult to come back and say i want to partake into this again mm -hmm. i want to be fully exhausted in front of everybody i want to you know have a poor showing and 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 for them to to so it's difficult it feeds into itself in terms of ego yeah it's different from uh it's different when you go out there and you are prepared and you have a good coach who prepares you and then you fail but like you know you kind of come close and you can see redeeming aspects of your you know how your training made you better you can see how you did some good things in the match then it's another thing when you when you literally don't have the proper mentorship and you go out there and think things just don't go your way at all and then you come back and you know you you do that 
debriefing, like you discussed with, you know, if, if there's a situation where you get into a conflict on the job and then you have to debrief and say, okay, we could do things better this way. We could do the things better this way, but your instructor just literally doesn't have those tools to give you. It's very difficult to go into another tournament. You know, it's like, well, maybe I'm not under someone who is actually going to be able to take me to that position. That's why it's so important. I, I recommend, you know, if you want to compete, it's really important that you have an instructor who has done a lot of tournaments, who's coached a lot of tournaments, who knows the rules. And then after, you know, they, they invest a lot of time in you, not just not just in your technique, but also, you know, your mindset and your physicality and your uh, the, your strategy and and all the, the holistic things that go along with being a competitor, not just like, are you good at jujitsu? OK, well, then you should do this tournament and then just go do it uh, and see how you do. It's like, no, let's let's look at the scenarios here. We want to play guard, but maybe they get to their guard first. So now you're you're forced to play top. Okay, well, let's go down this route now. Let's let's now address what are our goals from this position. What are okay? You got swept, so now you're down. Okay, well, we need to get back to a position where we can off balance our opponents. We can dig ourselves out of this hole and keep bolstering actual solutions rather than just saying, "Oh, go just go do it," and then not give you anything. Right. So it's like really important, I think, to have have a mentor that can actually get you into these, uh, that can pass this knowledge on to you. Yeah, so you, you, what you want essentially is tactically, you wanna have a primary plan and some contingencies. And you wanna have rehearsed both. You wanna have rehearsed your, your preferred course of action, the contingencies, and you have to intermix them because they may not come in the way that you've, again, try to, try to inject as many variables as possible in your, in your training regimen. And having seen even a variety of contingencies actually actually open your brains up to some decision making. If you have not and you are completely shocked, you are looking at critical stalls, you know, and that's what's going to happen. And I know in the in the context of policing, that's one of the things that we're trying to avoid critical stalls at a very at a, at a bad time. Something bad happens. It happens at a bad time. If if it if the circumstances change on you quickly and you have not prepared for it, you are behind the eight ball and you are likely to not make the right decision in the right time. So it's exactly the same for this. It's having those con- those contingencies, rehearsing those con- those contingencies, and uh, and making sure that you are ready for almost anything. And then ultimately, what it comes down to is there's always the one thing you have not prepared for that can come in. But I mean, if we start banking on the you know, on the small percentage or the, the small, um, the small, you know, percentage of time that this could be the case, then then you were not doing it right. It's about mitigating the risk, not eliminating all risk of being surprised, you know? Yeah. And I, I like I like what Dan Hur says about competition, where he's like, you know, just it's important to remember that this is what you would be doing on any given day, you would be going to the gym and just rolling mm-hmm. probably a lot more than if you went to a competition in a lot of cases, like, like my match is a 10 minute match. You know, it's like, it's daunting when I think about it because it's, it's someone who wants to win, doesn't want to, you know, get embarrassed or whatever. And they're a high level, highly skilled individual, but it's, it's just another role. And it's just, it's actually less rolling than if I were to go and teach a two hour class. Like if I was, it's less exertion arguably than uh, any other day. It's just, it just happens to now matter. It happens to have, uh, you know, you're either going to win or you're going to lose. So it's important to not look at it like, oh my God, I need to win this match. Like I, I just need to win this match. It's, it's more like, well, this is just, you do this every day and ignore the lights, ignore the fact that it's being streamed on Facebook in front of everyone. Everyone's going to be watching or, you know, pre COVID everyone's in the stands watching, ignore the lights. It's just a distraction. You've got to remove yourself from that so that you can make the decisions needed. I've, again, I've said, <laughs> I've said that so many times this episode, but, but uh, to, to just realize that a lot of it is an illusion and take yourself out of there and just do what you're trained to do naturally. And then that's where that, like you mentioned, you know, drawing a pistol out of its holster and just things are now automatic so that we can, you know, the automatic things stay automatic. And then the decision making becomes moment to moment. That's kind of how I'm going into this match thinking, because, uh, yeah, and I fully expect things to get hairy. You know, (laughs) I expect to get in on legs and then he slips out. And then if I go about the mindset, like, God, I should have finished that or whatever, or, you know, he's got really good leg lock defense. And if you start thinking like that, then, you know, the chance that you're going to get in on his legs are way lower because you doubt yourself when instead you just got to have that like 
battle tested mindset where it's like, okay, you escape, but I'm going back in. I'm going to try and get into it again, or I'm going to get on top and pass again, you know, rather than letting things mentally defeat you in the moment. Yeah. And you know, it's kind of funny because you mentioned something that's, uh, that's, that's, that's critical and that most people don't know, but when the body is preparing for battle, it conserves energy. When it conserves energy, it really doesn't want to do things, the things that you normally want to do. So interestingly enough, on a day to day basis, you're going to want to go to the gym and do as many, get as many roles in as you can with as many, you know, tough competitors or tough teammates as you can. And yet the day of the competition, you know, you don't feel like getting up. You don't yeah. feel like going, you don't feel like doing jujitsu even today for the first time in six months. I don't feel like doing jujitsu. No, that's your body playing tricks on you. But you need to understand that th th those are physiological reaction to what's coming to the anticipation of combat. So the body is now conserving the energy because it needs it. So as long as you understand that process, then you don't get prematurely panicky, mm -hmm. you know, like, because that's what happens. Like you premature panic. Like how come every single day this month? I felt like going to the gym and rolling and getting some hard rolls in. And this morning when it counts, I no longer want to. Yeah. I just want to stay here like, you know, in a, in a ball with my blankie and, you know, suck on my thumb type deal. But the reality is if you know, no, that's just my body preparing for battle. I'm conserving energy and that's cool. I don't feel like it now, but once the, once I get called to the mat, it'll to the mat, it will go, all go away and we're, we're going to get this done. Type yeah. deal, right? Excellent point. I mean, that is, uh, that's so true. A lot of the time when I think about, when I think about this match coming up or when I have a tournament, you know, and I think about it, I immediately can feel like butterflies. I immediately feel my, my heart rate increase. And that's my body just sort of like telling me, Hey, you know what? Like this will, this counts. This is not in the gym where no one sees. This is like, I know this guy's real good. And he knows I'm good. And, you know, we're two two really good guys in the area. And it's going to be hard. Like, I'm not used to someone this caliber. So my body is telling me like, oh, you, you know, it's it's you don't want to do this or whatever. And that's kind of, I guess, the fear kind of playing tricks on you when instead it's it's more about embracing the fear and using it to to empower you. Like another thing, you know, you, you say how sometimes that fear can make your body want to exert less or even in some cases, I think, be more passive. And one thing Danaher again talks about is how passivity will lose you so many more matches than going for something and then you fail and then you get countered, right? So it's like on game day, if you play a real passive game, a real reactionary game, that can bite you in the ass because opportunities that come up are not going to be acted upon. And so a lot of the time, you're just kind of in there. You're playing not to lose. But if you go in there saying, no, I'm going to I'm going to play to win and I'm going to be the one who gets the offensive cycles. I'm going to be the one who goes in there. And and uh, when I see an opportunity or if I create an opportunity, I'm going to act on it. That is a much better competition mindset than thinking, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to counter what he does or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to play like a reserved game to reserve energy. That is not really a good mindset when you're going into battle. Yeah, no, it, it's absolutely right. And one of the one of the places where you see that in, in I don't push the whole CrossFit thing on everybody, but I was at regionals of you know in 2013, and one of my really really good friend was competing regional, and that's high level competition. And and he said to me something I never forgotten. He he was in the I believe the third or fourth heat to begin. So the last heat is the strongest heat. So anyways, what ended up happening with him is because he was good and he was winning, he ended up skipping heat so he would go to the next heat the next heat and he said that the most he approached the top heat the less amount of excuses and negative self-talk and whatever that he heard from the from the competitors so on the first heat oh you know i'm just glad i made it here and you know i'm just happy and this is kind of a good experience on the the heat after that it was like you know, you know, I know I, I, I belong to be, I belong here, but you know, it, this workout really doesn't cater to my strength or whatever. And then he goes to the next heat and the last heat was like, I know I'm here. I know what I'm doing. I'm good to go. This is my type of workout. I'm going to own this. You know, like there is a clear distinction between mm -hmm. mindset as you get closer to the winning people, you know? Yeah. And that's the same thing in jujitsu. And, uh, you know, I'm a guy who doesn't do a lot of IBJJF tournaments, but they sort of seed the brackets by i guess you know they'll have like the highest seed versus the lowest seed first right so this is something that you can that you'll experience when you go in and i'm not a huge fan of checking the brackets you know uh and and sort of 
fetishizing or obsessing over who I'm fighting and being like, oh my God, I'm fighting like this guy who's really good. Because I think that's also, it is important to know, but to know what they do on the mats or whatever. But if you're going against like Lucas Lepre in the first round, it's like, fuck it. You, you could defeat yourself before you even step in the building, right? If, you, if you're like, oh my God, I'm going against this legend. Yeah, you put him on a pedestal. That is that guy knows that he can win. He's a multi-time world champion, right? But if you go in there thinking, oh my God, I'm going to fight this guy, I'm going to lose. Well, good chance you're probably going to lose because you've already, again, that self-doubt and that fear has overcome you. And now you're just playing not to lose, right? Or playing not to get submitted, I guess, in a jiu-jitsu situation. Yeah, no, it's um, it's a very, very dangerous road to go down on for sure. I guess... Do we want to talk, Matt, about some of the some of the sort of strategies like to positively reframe some of the, you know, some of the stuff that we were talking about earlier with respect to the negative voices in my head? And how can I replace that with some positive? For sure. That sounds awesome. Sort of, you know, without getting too deep into the cognitive behavioral therapy. But uh, take, for example. So here's one of the things that, that I like to do. And I and I did that with my with my guys on the team. The emotional self is is the part of you that you are trying to impact, right? So it's not about critically thinking about the things that you're saying to yourself, because those things are actually subconscious mostly. So most of us, most humans will be self-defeating. Most humans will be self-defeating and most humans will be self-sabotaging. A lot of people walk around the daily thinking, I'm not good enough for the job that I'm in. I'm not good enough for the wife that I have. You know, I'm not a good enough parent or whatever the case may be. And we tend to do this at an alarming rate. And 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 there are a variety of reasons for this, but we're, let's not get into those. Instead, sometimes there comes a times where the, those little voices have to be shut down. And nothing more critical than when you're entering a stronghold where somebody has, you know, killed eight people and you're potentially next in line because you're going to get them. And you have to you have to shut those down and just go to war. Um, so one of the one of the ways that I used to to really reprogram myself is I found so for me everything that is in a tactical setting is really appealing to me it creates an emotional reaction if I watch a video you know with with some shoot move and communicate while there's some mo motivational speaking going on in the background it really reaches into me it into my soul and, and it actually gets my hair to stand up and it creates a re an emotional reaction so what I do is I actually play them on a loop while I clean my house and, you know, sweep the floor and do the do the the dishes or whatever the case may be. And I let them play loudly, blasting, you know, like and and so what ended up happening is and and on repeat, not just like one time, okay, oh that was really good. That was really motivating. Let it drive it into your system. Like, you know, become a part of you. And what ended up happening with me is I would wake up at night reciting, you know, luck is the last dying wish and those who believe that winning can happen by accident, you know, momentum's a cruel mistress, you know, whatever the case may be. And just, and just in the tactical settings and right into the core and into my soul, it was now changing the way I perceived and the way I spoke to myself with respect to the job that I had to do and what needed to get done. So, what I have done with some people that had issues of self-defeating with respect to working out or maybe making some life changes that would benefit them in the long run is using that type of reprogramming, a positive reprogramming. And that's actually quite old and documented and it, and it works mm -hmm. ultimately, but you, you just have to find the thing. So if you're a dancer, I did that with my girls. I did that with my daughter, Abigail. She's a national gymnast or now her back's broken. So she's a little bit on the, on the sort of recovery side. You know, just having them inner setting the same talks that I was listening to, except on the front of a gymnastics, you know, kind of images and whatever. So it was really catering to her and really, really uh, tapping into her emotional self. And she was a champ. So is my daughter, my other daughter, which is a, a dancer, and she's doing really, really well. And both of them, you know, did that since they were lit, uh, young kids. So and 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 it. Our, our emotional self will revert to what it knows. So if you're doing it for three months, even if you did it for two weeks, trust me on this, if you do it for two weeks and you're religious about it and you are doing it consistently, you will see some incredible changes right away. If you stop for two or three weeks after that, you will already start reverting to what you used to do, which is maybe a little bit more negative self-talk or whatever. And if you wait three months, you are guaranteed back where so you just it just needs to be a kept. That is something that is ingrained in humans. It's a, it's primal and we do that. 
So it needs to be done, but it needs to be maintained. It almost sounds like a like a self hypnosis almost like you're just creating like a, a loop or, a, or again, it's, I guess, like a trigger. I assume this could be it could manifest in many different forms like you you could have like you said, a loop of like a motivational, motivational talks. It could be training while you have, you know, sometimes sometimes when I have uh, the kids in there, or at least pre-COVID, when we were getting ready to do competitions, when we thought there would be competitions, we would pipe in like really loud crowd noises, things like that. I know that a lot of people will read like parts of the Bible, like Psalms, where it's, you know, it's very like they're about to go into battle and they're and they're using these motivational pieces to motivate. I know uh, GSP has talked about, you know, watching footage of animals in nature, you know, at hunting and things like that and 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 focusing on how can I be the predator, not the prey. So I guess there could be many different ways that you could do this. And yeah, just like you said, I mean, if you stop doing it, I guess it drastically could fall off. Do you do you sort of think that that is like a like a form of hypnosis or how, how do you sort of how do you think about that? Yeah, it, it is. It absolutely is a form of hypnosis. And the reason why I know that is one of the ladies here in the country in Canada that was uh, the head of some hypnosis department, uh, you know, here locally. But also she she was a lecturer and went to Toronto University and did a whole bunch of different talks and, and around the country was essentially one of the best in the country. Uh, and she explained to me that. That's precisely what it is, is what you are doing is you are bypassing the cerebral cortex and you are going straight to the emotional sort of being. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do because humans are guarding against that because we know or we feel that if we're exposing emotions or if we're regulated, if we're self-regulated by them, that we are weak, that we're going to get eaten alive. It's, it's, a, it's a very fear-inducing sort of place to be. So it's not it's it's not uncommon for people to be struggling with some things that are deeply ingrained emotionally and try to do it through their thought process and they cannot get over it. You will never get over it because the subconscious mind doesn't have a concept of time. So it doesn't matter if it happened 75 years ago, if it happened seven minutes ago, it's exactly the same. But your brain makes a big difference because it happened 75 years ago. I should be over this by now. Those are two different things that are completely disconnected. And, and they actually are. And there are some interconnection. But at the base level, what you want to do is address the emotional side. And so critical that you tap into that emotional. It's exactly what it is. Self hypnosis. That's yeah. exactly what it is. It's just you're, you're, you're not necessarily in a relaxed state. You're not necessarily in a, you know, and, and people have misconception about hypnosis. Like the movies are portraying it like you're, you know, unconscious and like speaking about things and saying things you wouldn't want to say and like yeah. revealing all the truth and whatever. But that's not what hypnosis is all about. Yeah, my my wife, actually, um, she did a course, not a course, like a program. I, I, I forget what it's called. I think it's called hypno babies, but essentially when she went, when she got pregnant for the second time, um, she, she said, okay, well going into labor, which is honestly, I think the fucking craziest thing that a human aside, maybe aside from war can go through because you're so close to death, you know, and you're bringing a life into this world. you you know, you're going to experience extreme amounts of pain. And she used this hypnosis program to sort of uh, have that mental mental reassurance throughout the process. And she said that it helps so much um, with Remy, the, our second born, as opposed to Zara, where she basically just went in blind, didn't know what to expect or whatever. And she said that the it had such a positive effect on the experience. She was actually able to like, I don't know if I would say she enjoyed the experience, but she was able to kind of take a step back and observe rather than be caught in the moment. And I think that that's something that's super important. If you're about to do something like go into combat, whether, whether you're taking your team into a, into a stronghold, or if I'm going into a competition or whatever, to have that, uh, that affirmation, you know, okay, like we've been, we've been here, we've reassured ourselves. We're going to, we're not going to just get caught up in the moment. We're actually going to step back and observe. And then that way we can be more tactical. We can be more logical. So that was something that like, I was really, I thought that was kind of cool when, you know, we're talking about hypnosis and that's, that's something that, you know, she said really helped her out throughout the second labor. And I mean, both labors were reasonably smooth, but the second one, she actually was like, it was so much easier have going in with that mindset. So let's bring it back to how we were starting the conversation off. Seb, we were talking about fight or flight posture or submit dichotomy. I know you wanted to talk a little bit more about that. 
yeah, we got dragged in some solid rabbit holes here. <laughs> yeah, so again, historical misconception, fight or flight, when the reality is posture and s submitting is, is something that's more common, especially intraspecies. So what happens, in, especially in North American culture, is we want to impart onto others that it's not a good idea to fight us by basically puffing up our chest and kind of, you know, being loud and and wanting to illustrate how tough we are and how, how, how good we are at combat or at fighting. And, 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 and there's a lot of that going on. And it's and it's quite interesting because it's wrapped into insecurities and it's wrapped into overcompensation. And it's and that's why, the, you know, you always hear the always be weary of the person that's calm in the room versus the person that's loud and boisterous. And I think there's an understanding that generally, mm. that generally that's the case. But it's interesting because if you look at in the animal kingdom, for example, animals will generally fight to the death with other animals. But when they're intraspecies, they will actually posture, not that they don't posture at other times, but they will generally posture heavily with their own species. And then they will do things that are non-lethal combat as in, we're going to find out who's the toughest. And then once we do, the other one will walk away type deal. And it's very interesting because that, again, ties into what I believe is the, the preservation of their own species. Like, why would they fight to the death, you know, on the daily type deal? So it's interesting because humans are, are, are not, you know, we're animals really with, with larger brains and, and, and well, arguably, mm -hmm. um, I mean, physically larger <laughs> for sure. And when you say posturing, it's not yeah. just how you carry your body but is the person trying to you know are they being verbally aggressive mm -hmm. are they closing the range and trying to impose you know trying to make you take steps back mm -hmm. you know are there are their hands up sort of kind of an overall body positioning not just the positioning of the spine like we refer to in terms of alignment no 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 exactly <laughs> yeah i'm i'm you're essentially right yeah as we're talking about threat cues here right and this is something matt i think down the line we should probably get into in terms of like interpersonal human aggression but a symptomology of this and how to avoid you know like physical de-escalation and how to prevent danger and harm and you know those kinds of things but i certainly think that we're certainly not getting into it today but uh, but you're absolutely right that's exactly that's exactly what it means uh, and 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 the submit part which again is the concerning part occurs quite often so uh, people will submit when when they're in danger so interesting and, and for a tie-in with the bjj world and say the tournament world because we've spoke about tournament the entire uh, podcast is when you walk around with your own insecurities afflicted by universal phobia which is interpersonal human aggression and you have your own insecurities with respect to your training and your abilities. And in addition to this, you are surrounded by people that are posturing because they're as insecure as you are. I think it's just a good reminder to say, look, man, like nothing is what it seems. That's why I really appreciate it when high level competitors put their earphones on, you know, like listen to music, head down, warm up nice and relaxed, as you mentioned earlier, Matt. And when when their, their name is called on the mat, somebody has to tap them on the shoulder because they don't actually hear it. And then just shut the music down and then it's game time. Mm -hmm. You know that you know that switch in that beautiful scene in Gladiator when he's looking at the little bird right before the battle and all of a sudden he just kind of turns around and now it's war? That's precisely what sort of needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And energy conservation, relax, don't overthink all these people that are walking around posturing. They're as insecure as everybody as everybody in the in the room. It, you know, it really doesn't matter. Like don't start uh, creating a, a fictitious world that pins you or that makes you a victim instead sort of dig in like a victor earphones on relax yeah i definitely um you know doing my fair share of competitions you're always sort of sizing guys up in the bullpen and you're wondering like oh is this my guy is this the guy in my division or oh he looks pretty big is that i wonder what he weighs and you know all the all these guys and if you get so so hung up on that then you, your mind really starts to play tricks on you because a lot of these guys are you know jumping around and trying to show oh i'm this athletic or i'm i'm this rearing to go and then a lot of the, a lot of the times the guys that win divisions like you said are just sort of sitting off to the side and and relaxing because they're they know that, that a lot of that is just wasted energy they don't need to prove that they're the toughest in the bullpen they need to go out there and 
tactically win the match. So it's like, you know, they, they, they've they been there so many times or they're just that mature in their mindset that they just know, OK, like what happens in this bullpen doesn't matter. I could be fighting a guy who is bigger than me, who looks more aggressive than me, who has a meaner face than me. Their <laughs> their cauliflower ears are worse than mine. Like, you know, all these little things. If you start thinking about these things, you know, then you're just distracting yourself. You're creating this creating this image of of your opponent that might not be true. And then if you go in there thinking about all this stuff, it's just too many mind, right? You got to just, like we said, take things moment by moment and just say, this is just another person with, you know, with levers on their body that can be manipulated. And the, the goal is the same. The, the, the objective is the same. How we get there could be different and expect it to be tough, but don't worry about, you know, this person coming in and being, being meaner or stronger or bigger, or they got a nicer gi than mine or whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yep. No, I agree. <laughs> well, I had some questions here from patrons, if you don't mind. Yep, absolutely. <clears throat> so the first one is a question. It says, Seb, I would like to know, when is it time to fight, both in the context of physical fights, but also verbal confrontations? We always talk about de-escalation on the podcast, but is there a point when you need to fight back? How do you identify when you reach that point? And I guess there is no really right or wrong answers. This is sort of your opinion from someone who has, you know, martial artist and been in the force for many years. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, especially when we when we speak about verbal fights, like what does that mean, right? Does that mean with the wife or does that mean with the kids or does that mean at the at the gas station? <laughs> I assume you don't want to fight your wife physically. I think this is asking Okay, verbal confrontations could mean like like the example we used earlier. I'm in the lineup, you budge in line. Mm-hmm. I say, "Hey man, the line's there, you know, can mm-hmm. you can you respect the system that we've set up in society?" Not your wife arguing and that's like, <laughs> "You know what? <laughs> Fuck you." Boom, punch the face. I don't I don't think that's what they're talking about. Let's assume stranger, maybe they're trying to posture on you being physical a little bit, or maybe they are verbally, you know, or, and or verbally threatening you. At what point do you say, okay, you know what? I've tried to be calm. I've, I've tried to deescalate this. It's not working. I now need to be physical. At what point do you make that switch? Yeah, that's, this could probably be an episode by itself. I mean, <laughs> It's a vast question. Like, it's a huge it's, It is. Question, I mean, it is. Honest. It's, you know, are we, have we reached a point where you're, you're now in a situation where an assault is imminent? Like, are you going to get attacked? Are you, you know, or are you trying to go somewhere? Are you trying to, you know, tactically reposition or go or leave or, and you're being prevented from? Cause that's a completely different scenario. So I think in your, question lies the answer. If you feel like you're trying to leave and this person is stopping you from leaving or you're trying to make space and they are now closing the space and they are, you know, they're clearly showing you signs of, you know, that they want to fight, you could maybe have just answered your own question, right? Yeah. And that's, and I apologize for this, man. I'm really trying my very best here, but ultimately what it comes down to is there are a variety of different threat cues that will be given out by somebody like pre-assault, uh, pre-assaultive sort of threat cues or verbal cues or non-verbal cues. And it's, it's almost, it's critical that humans start recognizing those and generally they're extremely poor at it. So, you know, I think what we need to do, Matt, as I as I spoke earlier, is we need to potentially uh, eventually dive deep into this and into have scenarios. Yeah. And just and just discuss, you know, some of the some of the tactical principles, you know, like having that time distance relationship and expecting another person to come out when you're having when you're speaking to another one and watching the hands because yeah. they're delivering the threat and doing those things. But ultimately, I will say this. There has to be something majorly majorly wrong for me to entertain any sort of off-duty confrontations like in the policing realm if i'm to about to arrest someone which by the way i don't do anymore so don't worry about that but i did and when i did there was legal grounds to do something and there was no arguing around that so i would try to negotiate my way out but eventually ultimately you're getting arrested so that's different but if i'm in a bank lineup and the person budged in front of me and i asked them politely and tactfully to go back to their spot and it escalates into something that's becoming way bigger i will be the i will actually cut my losses you'll submit i will cu- i will cut my losses yeah and I-, I think that's a smart idea considering 
it's just not worth it if it's a if it's someone who's being an asshole and they want to get into in front of you in the lineup maybe they're having a bad day maybe they've had a rough upbringing i think it's a smart idea to submit at that point and to just like it's not it's no reason to get into a fist fight at that point well look you also got to think like humans in general especially this new generation humans they don't take the two two three steps back and and raise their fist and go let's go like everybody is scared out there people are stabbing each other people are getting shot and people are thinking that that's actually not random there's always a gang affiliation or whatever the case may be which couldn't be further from the truth so back in the 90s during the biker war in in quebec the hell's angels and the rock machines were waging a crazy war for those of you who were born then and if not just research it uh they would you know try to shoot each other with rocket launchers and club lineups and whatever it didn't matter who they killed in the process If you got in a road rage and and with the wrong person at the next light, you were dead meat, period. Like one finger flick and bullets would come through your windshield or, or your side window. So for me, again, you know, what is at stakes? Like, yeah. am I am I protecting my kids and I doing certain things? That's a completely different story. If there's any way out of conflict and I can maintain continuity and perhaps, you know, either call the cops or whatever and follow from a distance and do certain things, I will be, I will prefer that course of action uh, long before, long before uh, actually getting into it. Right. It's almost like a risk first reward scenario. It's like, if this guy is just going to be a dick and go in front of me in the lineup, then go ahead. But if, if, but if that's not what his goal is, if his goal is, okay, now I need to, I need to physically show you that I'm stronger than you and I'm going to attack you. At this point, you just assess the risk first reward. You assess the the physical cues. You exhaust your options of de-escalation. You know, hey, I don't, you know, let's let's not do this right now. But if you feel like, uh, you know, maybe they're closing the distance, that's sort of when you would make a decision. Okay, my life is in danger now. It's no longer like an argument that we're trying to either win or lose or, or, or whatever. It's now like I'm fearing for my life now. That's when you would make you would switch gears and make a decision. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't want to it's again, I don't want to put into your head that you have to actually fear for your life. You may you may fear harm. Like it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, I'm going to lose my life like this guy's going to kill me. But if this guy is going to break my nose, we got problems like you, you, you know, especially if you're um, if you're attempting to deescalate and there's a there's a there's a natural escalation that's occurring there, which could lead to you suffering harm. There is a time and there is a point where. And, and it's interesting because I believe there is some civilian training out there. I know the states definitely have uh, civilian training to kind of train people to teach them like this is where the line should be in the sand. I, I definitely think that Canada has that in certain uh, certain areas. I'm not sure if we do here in Vancouver, but that to me is critical skills. It's kind of like swimming because it will happen in the course of your life. And if you don't know mm -hmm. and your your natural reaction goes against some of the some of the tactical principles you're going to end up you're going to end up paying right so again it's such a complex uh, it's such a complex conversation but i think it would be amazing to at some point have that conversation and kind of maybe bring some of those things to light to kind of help your your listeners make some critical decisions right cool question i got a question for you let's say let's say that scenario you're in the lineup or or whatever And you're by yourself, no kids, you're, you don't have anyone to worry about, you're off duty. Guy comes up and does what we talked about. And now he's got his fists in the air, like he's, you know, he's got his guard up and he's closing distance. Just, just a question for you, because you've done striking, you've done grappling. And he starts, let's say he's getting in your face and he's, he's close, he's within striking range. Do you strike? Do you level change and grab his legs? Do you... What do you do? <laughs> Guard up, I'm assuming. Your hands go up when you realize, okay, he's in he's reaching into my space right now and I feel I'm you got that sense like, oh shit. Okay, something could happen here. I just like in that scenario as vague as it is, again, it could be perceived many ways. What would be your first instinct? I don't know that I can answer that. It depends on a variety of different factors, but I what I will tell you is if that person comes into critical range, 
I did something wrong in the first place because I should have maintained that distance. So as, generally what happens is that person will be kind of walking slowly, edging, yeah, right? Yeah. And that's when I'm maintaining that distance, creating an angle, having a 45 degree angle versus being square to him. Yeah. So it makes it harder for him and he has to make a gross movement pattern in order to come and reach me and tap me on the nose. Like there's a variety of different things, that, uh, tactics and procedures that I'm going to implement before I have to. And if I feel like, okay, I got nowhere else to go and now it's time. Yeah. It's go time, uh, you know. It's it's likely going to be some sort of clinching scenario, you know. Like I, I don't know that I would shoot a double in the bank, you know. Like it, it, it it's um, it maybe I don't know, but uh, but Imanari roll, maybe <laughs> enter the legs, transition to the back, you know. But, systems. You know, I've been alive for a long time. <laughs> I've never had to double anybody in the bank lineup. <laughs> well, you don't go to CIBC. Yet. All right. Oh, that's good. I mean, yeah. it, and again, these these questions are very like there is no right or wrong answer. He, the, 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 the scenario could go so many different ways. Right. And here's the other thing, Matt. And as I mentioned earlier, so now I, I get into this physical confrontation. I mean, and now some weapon system comes out, right? Like it, the person reaches in their waistband and now I'm getting punched in the body, which we know what being punched in the body means when you're in a street fight because nobody punches anybody in, anybody in the body. If you're getting punched in the body, you're getting stabbed. So now what? You're, you know, you're, you're in a fight for your life, truly. So I, I think unless you are completely ambushed, it's such an unlikely scenario yeah, if I have to make a decision, then it'll be circumstance based. But I don't know that I can sit here and say what I would or wouldn't do, depending of what the environment is and where the yeah. exit exit routes are and all these other things. Yeah. How many people are in there and what's you know what's the yeah? It's it's pretty complicated. But. Cool. All right, this is a, this is an interesting one. I like Seb, how do I understand local laws? And again, local laws are all different depending on where where you are in the world, as it pertains to use of force and our jujitsu. Uh, most obviously the use of submissions, basically, how do you envision stay out of jail jujitsu? So I think what this is implying is yeah. there's a con, there's a conflict. It hits the ground. You want to use your jujitsu. You don't want to kill the person, but you want to use your jujitsu in a way that's not going to hold you legally liable later on. So like if you throw this guy in a, okay, maybe you do like a drop sale, he smashes his head into the ground, he dies, right? Or, or maybe you choke him an artery ruptures and he dies, you know, like a freak, a freak thing, I guess as a law enforcement officer, let's put it in that context, you're on the job and you're getting into a, a scuffle with someone at a bar and you want to control them. What are techniques that you would sort of steer clear of and what are techniques you would gravitate towards? See, the problem with this scenario is that in the context of law enforcement, it's a little bit different. So civilians are given a lot more lenience with respect to use of force and that, let me qualify that because... What if you're a black belt though? Well, no, it doesn't matter. Like, because there is a, la there is a lack of training there. There's a lot of hands and feet training, which you are good at, but there, the tactical side of it that isn't trained in you, the legal side of it that isn't trained in you. So you're not expecting to measure that with exactitude. I think ultimately what it comes down to is not so much what technique are you using, but what are you doing with it? And what is your intent, mm. right? And then it becomes a question of legal articulation following the issue. So here's the thing. If you have to go hands on with someone and you use your jujitsu and you have the person under control and you're holding him with a, I don't know, like a top position, Kimura, quarter mount, whatever the case may be. And all of a sudden they start trying to fight out of that again. And you're applying a wrist lock in addition, if you're a brown belt and you just say to them, look, if you don't stop fighting me, that arm could break. Yeah. It's very different than if you go out and break and that just arm break outright, yeah. right? So now the question becomes, if you were to speak to a jury of your peers, without being a jury, but if you had to speak to your peers and telling the story, would your action be reasonable in light of the totality of the circumstances? Or was there an excessive use of force? So you're allowed to defend yourself, mm -hmm. but you are also liable for excess use of force. Doesn't have to be measured with, with exactitude, but there are things that will contribute to that. I will give you an example. So I have him down. I don't know, for whatever reason, I disengage, which is generally not a good tactic unless somebody else is coming in and you may have to. But say I disengage and now this person's on the ground, he attempts to get up and I run over and soccer kick him yeah. in the head, right? That, yeah, that's, I mean, that's like basically trying to kill a guy. Exactly. I mean, you have to understand as a trained martial artist, whether you're doing striking or not, the head is, the bucket is a critical piece of equipment. And yeah. if you shut the lights on there, you could create some major issues. So 
uh, I would worry staying away from physical confrontation. But if you have to use control the way you would if you rode with somebody and you didn't want to really hurt them, mm -hmm. unless, of course, the, the circumstances dictate. So uh, evidently, if I'm on top in a top Kimura, and again, this is where this rabbit holes can go. I'm on top in a quarter mount with my Kimura and the second hand is not under control and he reaches in his waistband and now a knife is produced. Now what? Now is it reasonable to break it? Yes, it is, but it is critical that you understand your local laws. It is critical that if you don't have some use of force, if civilian courses in your area that you seek one or you take one if you can. I've seen guys go on those courses and do very well. I know in the States with a concealed carry, a lot of those, a lot of those people are taking those courses and it's, it's critical to, to understand. But ultimately the, the criminal code dictates what you right. are allowed and not allowed to do. Yeah. But it doesn't speak to specific techniques. It speaks to use okay. of force in defense and it speaks to excessive force. I know someone who works with, I don't know how else to put it, troubled youth, I guess, and certain techniques are outlawed. Like you're mm -hmm. not allowed to grab their neck. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to do chokes and things like that. When honestly, it could be super effective. For sure, yeah. There's a lot right now with what's going on with the defund the police movement and a variety of different organizations, including NYPD, are under some extremely restrictive use of force guidelines. Like I've heard that you're not allowed to do like neon. Yeah, neon, neon belly. Because of, I assume the George Floyd incident. Yes, it is. But I mean, you have to think how asinine that is. I mean, this legitimately, yeah. if I was an NYPD cop right now, I would have walked a long time ago. Like, because none not only are they not only are they endangering their members by doing yeah. that, but they're also will not have their backs if they end up in a situation where they have to use certain techniques. Yeah. So so you're it's a it's a double whammy. You may be successful in arresting and proceeding with your arrest and you may be safe in doing so, but you get eaten alive by your own department, which prohibits certain actions or the city in that case or whatever the case may be. Or it, just imagine if every day I ask you to potentially put your life on the line, but I restrict the things that you do so exactly. much that I will not have your yeah. back when you do. Yeah. See you later. I've heard of that. I heard in New York, they are restricting like neon torso, neon neck situations. Vascular neck restraint. Yeah, because yeah. because of what happened to George Floyd. And I'll say this. I think the neon neck technique that was used is not bad. But what you what you mentioned was the intent behind it. So now he's been subdued. He's, he's handcuffed and then you hold your knee on his neck for eight minutes, 45 seconds. That is where, that is where I think that that is an excessive use of force. I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, you pin a, a, a suspect down, you have your knee on their torso because it's an effective way to immobilize them. It's, you know, you, they can't attack you easily and your hands become free to handcuff them. You know, maybe you, if you need other people to help you, maybe, then that's that's whatever it is but like it's not that necessarily the technique that was wrong i think it was the intent behind it and just he's clearly subdued and now he's he's saying hey i can't breathe or whatever so that's when we need to switch gears and, and be able to say okay like okay let's check on his health let's get someone else in here the best way to put it matt is we have a professional responsibility of care like i don't care what we just dealt with some of our guys were in in shootings and they were being shot at and shot back and, and hit a, a suspect multiple times. And as soon as it happens and that person is down, the, the weapons are sling are slung and the guys are out. The medics are out with their with their trike and their and their tourniquets and, and they're applying life saving care on the suspects. And they do that every single time that mm -hmm. this happened. Not that it's a regular occurrence, but when it does happen, as soon as the arrest and control is is conducted, Immediately, there should be a switching gear into yeah. life-saving mode. I don't care who they are. This is an ethical issue. Yeah. It has nothing to do with your personal choice or liking or not liking someone. Or, you know, or that person tried to hit, try to hurt me, you know, personally. So now I'm like, I got a personal vendetta. I'm going to, I'm going to not administer first aid or do whatever. Now, yeah. that's not your job. Your job is to be a professional. You call yourself a professional, then do your thing. If you are forced to apply force based on the totality of the circumstances, once safe to do so, switch the gear and provide the, the, the care of that person. Couldn't agree more. Fantastic. Okay, one more question. Seb, are you familiar with Ken Murray? He's a Canadian violence researcher and the Force Science Institute. If so, what are your thoughts on building high quality reality based self defense scenarios? And where can we fit this? Where can we fit BJJ into this paradigm? So I think it's just asking like mm -hmm. scenarios on the job where 
you know, maybe maybe the distance gets closed and now it's hand to hand. Now it comes down to using grappling to subdue someone. And uh, what are your thoughts on building those scenarios as part of your training as law enforcement? Yeah, so I am familiar with Ken. I, I read uh, his uh, training at the speed of life and, and, and a variety of other publication and lectures that he has done. He, and I also I'm familiar with the, uh, the Force Science Institute and I've drawn upon their exp expertise over the years several times. Um, and yes, uh, amazing work and outstanding work supporting the law enforcement community and making us professional uh, on the part of these guys. What I would say to this is what I did with my team. So essentially, it goes through building blocks, right? So I'm imparting the skills first, as far as the BJJ is concerned, and I continue rolling my regular scenario based training with relation to, you know, the, the rest of the tools that we use and the tactics and procedures that we use. But what I would do is I would fill what I call mental void uh, in areas where so Matt is is what it, Matt is speaking about is for example now somebody has closed the distance well there are always ways with somebody could close the distance on you in a variety of setup in the scenarios but the, the best way to do it is to actually actually stage it in your scenario so what I used to do with my guys is I would bring them say in a in a bathroom stall and then I would somehow grab one of them pause the scenario take his pistol put it on the ground, put some fake blood like FX bloods in their hands, and then I would have them go hands on with a suspect that had maybe an edged weapon or maybe he didn't have any or maybe. So now what would happen is they would actually be parachuted in a scenario where some of those techniques would go and we would, you know, do our best to mitigate the risk and have some mats, uh, you know, around so they wouldn't, wouldn't fall on the toilet and we have some spotters to protect them if they started flying everywhere. But ultimately, it got ugly. Like we got them to really tussle and, uh, and, and we do it in open air movements outside a stronghold. You know, they're approaching an entry point. Next thing you know, some panicked, um, custodian or whatever comes out and, and, and jumps one of the guys and, and we let him deal with it. So we tell the other guys, you are not in play. So this is just like reinforcing the worst case scenarios. Cause in reality, there would always be someone nearby or almost always. Uh, and, and our guys would be going hands on with that person to assist. But I think the key here is to try to replicate these scenario where where using your the skills that you acquired through your regular hands and feet training or your BJJ training and do so in a semi sterile environment, with some added stimuli and more realism. Also, what I used to do with my guys is I used to say we, we would have them grapple with their duty belt on with their pistol on so they understood how it rest restricted sort of the hip movements or moving around your duty belt or or which side you had to be so that your pistol wasn't get getting retrieved by the person mm -hmm. on top of you or we would dump a shock knife in there so we would have two guys grappling like regular jujitsu and next thing you know there's a shock knife and for those who are not familiar those shock knives are not fun like they have so is that like a taser kind it of? is it is and it's a blade <laughs> it's like i stabbed it, you. it, it goes that's around a, the blade yeah. and and there's there's some settings on there that are pretty heavy. I, you, you can literally, you know, feel your soul leave your body when this starts cutting into you. So what we would do is we we would have two guys grapple. Everything's good to go. All of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. You know, the uh, the shock knife falls on the ground. And now it's like a battle for their lives. You know, <laughs> who, who's going who to get to that knife or that weapon system the, the fastest? So with that, there, there there's a few things. And I'm sorry if I kind of go all over the place, but there's a few things that are to, to be considered. A, you need to have... You need to have like your agency's support in order to uh, carry on the, those types of training. So there has there has to be an understanding that you know injuries may occur, and that's just the that's just the reality of training. But the alternative is 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 worse because uh, those injuries or the the potential ramifications are going to be death or dismemberment or harm in a, in an operational setting, which could lead to the demise of a variety of different people or uh, an inability to achieve the mission. So there has to be, ultimately though, it cannot be okay corral and it cannot be absolute craziness. Like it has to be controlled. It has to be reasonable, but, and it also cannot be done every single time. So just go out there, train, train your people with the BJJ techniques, roll them from time to time in some of the scenarios, test some of your guys, get yourself a baseline, do it again three months later, you know, that kind of stuff. That's my suggestion on that. Sounds to me like you're describing almost 
situational sparring, except you're adding weapons, uh, <laughs> utility belt. Like, I think the utility belt would be interesting because, like you said, if you're on the wrong side, you can't access your pistol. Or maybe you give access to your pistol to your opponent. Or maybe you couldn't do certain techniques that you would normally be able to do because now there is a you know, a piece of gear that's stopping you from moving. So I think that that's a really great answer. And I guess you can kind of, you can go infinite directions with that. It could be in closed quarters. It could involve a pistol. It could involve a knife. It could be, there could be multiple attackers. So yeah, that's really good. Well, I think that was a fantastic chat. Anything else you want to add to that, Seb? No, man. Thank you very much for having me. And um, and I would like to also just extend those thank you to uh, some of the people that have provided feedback from the first podcast and 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 wanted to hear more from me. And I, you know, it's uh, it's really humbling to uh, to be reinvited um, on account of of sort of your people asking. And um, and I couldn't, uh, you know, I hope I didn't disappoint you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we did have a lot of stuff that we actually couldn't speak about today. So probably going to do a second part with Sebastian. Um, you know, we did go down some rabbit holes today, which is the norm for podcasts. Um, again, I know we missed Steve Kwan today. I hope I did a good enough job. Before we get out of here, I just want to say thank you to the patron members. Um, I really appreciate all your support and everyone who tunes into the podcast uh, on a weekly basis. If you are interested in donating to the show, you can do so by going to www.patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. Of course, if you like cool gear, hoodies, shirts, patches, you can go to the BJJ Mental Models store. And uh, yeah, again, we really appreciate all your support and I hope you enjoyed the chat and I hope to have Seb back on the show relatively soon. So uh, Sebastian, thank you very much and uh, take care of you guys. 